For next medication uh, may be designed uh, by artificial intelligence. Biotech firm in silico medicine beginning human trials of a drug developed uh, by AI. The therapy uh, treats a chronic lung disease and the company claims it's the first drug entirely discovered and designed by artificial intelligence to begin a phase two clinical trial. Join us now is former FDA uh, Commissioner Dr. Scott Gottlieb. He also serves on the board of FISA uh, and Illumina and is a CNBC contributor. I don't know where we went over the, uh, the tipping point for, for, getting, uh, for calling it this, uh, Scott, because I, I can go back. I remember years ago, uh, the, the new guy at, at the MIT Center for Cancer Research, you might even know him, Tyler uh, Jacks. The reason they picked him was because he was going to fuse a lot of um, computer technology with drug discovery. Uh, with combinatorial chemistry, a rational drug design, use computers to see what, what compound is going to bind most tightly uh, to, to the target. So we've been using computers for how many years? And, and when did we cross over the step where we call it artificial intelligence, when it's been incorporated for years and years and years? What's the difference now? Yeah, I think you're exactly right. We've been using these in sil silico tools probably since the early 2000s. There were companies that were formed in the early 2000s based on rational drug design using computers to help design the drugs and discover the new targets and the drugs that would hit those targets. Um, it does appear that this company has made heavier use of those tools, but there's a lot of companies that are making very heavy use of those tools. So I'm not really sure if there's a tipping point when it comes to the discovery and the development of novel molecules to hit new targets and using computers for that purpose. I think where we're going to see a lot of innovation is, is continuing to incorporate these tools in early discovery and development um, and refining molecules, but also moving them closer to the patient, using some of these artificial intelligence tools, these large language models, uh, to help stratify and select patients into clinical trials that are more likely to benefit from some of these drugs, less likely to experience side effects, and then ultimately having the regulatory constructs to move those into the care, care uh, setting, to move them into healthcare and guide how we deliver drugs to patients uh, in the healthcare setting. That's going to be, I think, the real tipping point to allowing these tools to really start to make substantial improvements in the delivery of healthcare. I can imagine that it, the convergence of uh, like 3D imaging for different compounds, you know, where you see the active site of, of an enzyme or something, you could use AI to design something that's not even naturally occurring. I that's think. right. Go yeah, on. that's right. That's how these in silico tools are being used. And also, we've done a good job of drugging diseases caused by single genes or single proteins or single enzymatic pathways. With some of these large language models, what you're going to be able to do is look across multiple genetic and proteomic changes and find molecules that can intervene on them simultaneously if, if a disease is being caused by Multiple, multiple modalities. Also, there's going to be multimodal models coming out later this year that can look across not just genomic and proteomic data and phenotypic data, data on how patients um, are behaving, how they're responding to drugs, their symptoms, but also imaging data. And once you have those large language models that can look across multiple different forms of data, you're going to start to make correlations that are just too hard to do from you know, traditional discovery vehicles. Yeah, you think about what big data tells us about you know, mundane, well, not mundane, but marketing or, or consumer habits. And, and think of what you could do with big data on drug-drug interactions and, and outcome and, and, uh, and all kinds of, you know, what, what prognosis is ours and survival rates, all the things that you could use the big data for using AI uh, just to, uh, you know, to, to design the best drug you could possibly use for someone with the best outcome. I mean, it's, it's kind of daunting. I'm glad there's people that are doing this. But uh, it, it seems like it, it's going to take a lot of work and a lot of computer power. Right. And the key is also the quality of the data, making sure there's adequate tra transparency around the data sets that are being used to train these models and also the quality of the data that's going in. We do have AI tools that are used in healthcare right now, for example, tools that are used to help augment um, diagnoses of radiology scans and imaging, also right. pathology. But those were trained on locked data sets, data sets where we knew the integrity of the data and the reliability of the data. So, you know, for example, you might train an AI tool that's used in imaging on known MRI scans where you had radiologists reading those scans and verifying that a tumor was, in fact, a tumor. 
Uh, it becomes more complex when you start to train these models on the totality of data that might be in an electronic health record, for example. And you're going to have to find ways to ensure the uh, integrity of that data, the quality of the data, and you also want transparency around it. So if, if the data, for example, in an EHR, in an electronic health record, is saying that a patient was ventilated, what does that mean? You want consistent terminology across different medical records. There's yeah. tools for doing that, and I think that's going to be the key, um, getting those tools incorporated. And that's also going to be the key to regulation by the FDA. The FDA is going to want ways to ensure the quality of the data, and that's going to be the nexus for how they regulate these tools that are ultimately used to guide patient care. I mean, it's mind-boggling. This could AI could be in, in healthcare could be the biggest uh, usage. You could you could uh, present data to the HMS uh, or, or to Medicare and Medicaid and, and say, look, this is why you need to pay for this, or uh, conversely, you could say, look, we're not getting any benefit from, from all this money, and there's no, no, no reason to, to, to even do it at this point. I can think of so many different uses uh, for, for when you could uh, you know, aggregate a lot of different data. It, it, I wonder if, it's, if doctors, I think this is once again where it would be helpful, not necessarily displace, uh, displacing doctors. But you know, medicine is an art, as you know, and, and an experienced clinician Right, an experienced clinician can be presented with a lot of stuff and just take a guess on what's really happening. With AI, would you be able to, it would not be a, 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 an art, it would be a, a pure science medicine at, at that point. You might not need the in, intuition of a great doctor. Well, look, I think it's certainly going to make, be the most impactful application in healthcare, not just drug discovery, but also the delivery of healthcare. You raised an interesting point in your comments about the use of these tools by insurers. This is creating a lot of consternation on Capitol Hill right now. Yeah. Um, this machines year say you can't can... have this. Yeah. Machines right. say you can't have this drug. You got to die. And, there, That's scary. and a lot of legislators are calling for new regulation. I think that would be a mistake to try to create new regulatory models. The existing regulatory models can adequately deal with these. We do have regulation of health plans in terms of how they deal with claims and claim denials, and you can apply those rules to the use of these tools. And so my concern is that these healthcare applications could get scoped into some of these calls for regulation more broadly of AI. And what we need to recognize is that when it comes to healthcare, there's a lot of existing regulatory frameworks that have been put in place over a long period of time that are, that are adequate to deal with these tools and the incorporation of these tools, not just into drug development and drug delivery.